It's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker today, Dr. Kenny Borajas, uh, who's going to talk about stroke care system integration, the challenges and solutions. Dr. Barajas is the Chief of Office of Care Integration from Maryland Institute of, for Emergency uh, Medical Cell Service Systems. He is responsible for the office that monitors and designates 150, 105 specialty programs in the state of Maryland, including adult and pediatric trauma centers, perinatal and neonatal referral centers, cardiac intervention centers, stroke centers, freestanding emergency department, he, he enjoys helping organization leaders and clinical stroke teams to continuously improve patient care and patient outcomes. He wears many, many hats. Besides that, he's also part of the Joint Commission uh, Senior Surveyors. So we had a fortune to work with him in the past. It's our honor to welcome Dr. Kenny Barajas back to tell us the system integration solutions and challenges. Thank you, Kenny. So Harvard University just released uh, some research, and I want to tell you what that is. They just confirmed that fear is not real. And unfortunately, they also confirmed that postprandial somnolence is real. So I'd like to thank the organizers for putting me in this slot. So I have no disclosures, but what we are going to do is something different. We, we've been highly scientific. We, we've been looking at different procedures, looking at, at, at patients and, and, and figuring out what the best treatment is. I'm going to change that up a little bit and I'm going to talk about stroke programs, talk about stroke care system integration, some challenges that we have as a program, some challenges we have as a center that gets referred patients and also some best practices that I have seen all over the country. So from the historical perspective, um, stroke is really not too new for us, right? Hippocrates, the, the father uh, of medicine, uh, 2,400 years ago said, you know, this is bad, he identified it, and he called it uh, apoplexy, which is a Greek term for struck down by violence. And then in the 1600s, to continue the timeline, Dr. Webner said, you know, it's just not about lack of oxygen, but it is also hemorrhagic or bleeding into the brain. And then the timeline continues with the NINDS trial uh, and then the Mercy Retrievers. But we are still trying to figure out the rest of the story. So stroke care system integration is a coordination collaboration amongst various healthcare providers, facilities and services. This is what this organization does very well. When I came here before, um, I noticed that we have great teamwork and that teamwork uh, is multidisciplinary and there's a good approach to patients um, and not just within a specific skill set or provider. We definitely noticed uh, pre-hospital care, acute stroke care, a multidisciplinary team approach, telemedicine, telestroke, post-acute care and rehab, uh, community education, prevention programs, data collection, and research, which is really significant for a comprehensive stroke center. We have challenges. We've known this for a long time. We've known about stroke, but we have challenges. And one of the challenges, it's time sensitive, right? We have to treat right away. Most patients that have a stroke don't come to us right away. So it's, we have to go out and, and seek the opportunity and convince people that are having a stroke to come into hospitals so we can treat them right away. And we have access to specialized care challenges. Uh, we have reperfusion therapy eligibility challenges, right? What do we do for the folks that are ineligible for reperfusion? How do we treat them? Where are we going with that when most people don't come in in time for us to treat them? Post-stroke rehab, 
how can we develop something uh, that addresses the physical, the cognitive, and the emotional needs uh, of what we need for our patients? Secondary prevention, they came to us. Now, how do we prevent the next one? And we have to start addressing the disparities. And we know recent documentation talks about disparities, and, and we need to target that population and, and really fix it um, so we can move forward. But not only do we have challenges, we have newer challenges or new challenges. So we know what to do. We know what things need to happen. Do we have the resources for them to happen? Do we have the right equipment, the right medication? Do we have the staffing? Are they trained well enough? Do we coordinate the care between departments? Do we assess the equity? Do we focus on continuous improvement? Do we have the data? Do we have the research? Do we analyze what we have to come up with what's next? Are we truly educating the public? Are we truly educating our healthcare providers to identify stroke? Our point person in the ER, the triage nurse, do they know how to pick up strokes? Do they understand more than just the face, arm, and speech? Do they understand the little things that could be occurring that leads us to a stroke, leads us to confirming or, or, or investigating a posterior stroke? Not only do we have new chances, new challenges, we have newer challenges. And, and, and the reason we have newer challenges is because we're, we're moving the goalpost, right? We are looking to see, hmm, those large cores, how large is too large? We're trying to figure that out, right? We're going deeper in the brain to retrieve clots. How far can we go? How low can we go on those aspect scores? We had the end of low trial. Is, is that the end? The answer is no. We keep going further and further, right? We look at the core penumbra mismatch. Has that been right? There's people that think we've had it wrong the whole time, but we don't truly understand it. What can we do? to make sure we understand what's next. The endovascular aneurysm treatment is changing as we heard today. So we need to keep addressing not only what is new, what newer challenges we have, and, and this is the problem. Every time we think we got it, every time we think we're aligned, we move the goalpost. And because we move the goalpost, we sometimes miss the mark. So I have this short video, and, and I want you to think as you're listening to this video, is this my typical patient? Is this what I usually see when I come into clinic? I guess there was a problem with the video. I can tell you, this is not your typical patient, right? This is someone who doesn't look like they used to. And we need to understand that. Definitely the scariest moment of my life. Model and media personality Haley Bieber opening up about the serious health scare last month that landed her in the hospital. I was sitting at breakfast with my husband, having a normal day, normal conversation, and we were in the middle of talking. And all of a sudden, I felt this really weird sensation that kind of like traveled down my arm. Justin was like, are you okay? And I just 
didn't respond because I wasn't sure. And then he asked me again. And um, when I went to respond, I couldn't speak. The right side of my face started drooping. I couldn't get a sentence out. Haley says Justin called 911. They did some scans and they were able to see that I had suffered a small blood clot to my brain. Not, not your typical patient. Everybody knows this better than me. A stroke can occur to anywhere, any age, any race, any gender, any place, any time to anyone, right? We need to change our mindset. I, I can tell you it's very difficult for people, but uh, it, it has to be changed so, so we can move forward. So we need to go beyond the basics, right? So it's the basics of beyond. We got our golden drug, right? We know the thrombolytic. We got our miracle treatment when it comes to uh, uh, ischemic strokes. We know who our essential therapies are. The future has the past, but we still need to move forward. We got our golden drug. We got our golden treatment. Do we have all the neuroprotective therapy agents? Are we utilizing artificial intelligence, machine learning to help optimize what we have? Do we have it right? Some folks say it's not as clear as it should be, right? Do we have the right rehab technologies? Are we looking at genetic factors? Are we really focused on secondary prevention strategies? What kind of stem cell therapy, ongoing research, clinical trials are we looking at? Today, someone mentioned the Zodiac trial. It, it, are we doing it? We did the research. Is that going to affect change? Is that generalizable? Some people argue it is, and some people definitely argue it is not. Is Librexia going to be our game changer? We don't know. But what I do know is in order for us to have a well-rounded program where it's just not physicians doing a procedure of different sorts, um, it is truly a multidisciplinary collaboration that is essential to refine and translate all our innovations into practice. So we got to have a solid process. And something I have done over 800 times across the country is evaluate stroke programs from acute stroke rating to the comprehensive level. And I can tell you this, an efficient process of stroke care is definitely associated with better outcomes, reduced disability, and improved survival rates. The healthcare system and service lines should continuously strive to optimize these processes through guidelines, uh, quality improvement uh, to ensure timely and effective stroke management. So how do we improve? Education and awareness is key, right? We have to understand that for our patients, they need to get it. They need to understand that we need to challenge. We need to uh, make better. Uh, we need to be able to affect our modifiable risk factors. If we don't convince them of that, they're not going to do better, right? The, the emphasis is time is brain, and they need to come in so we can treat them. We can have all the experts in the world, but they don't come in on time. We can have tragedy. For healthcare workers, it has to be multidisciplinary. It has to be, and it has to be the neurosurgeons, neurologists, even the cardiologists helping us, just like we heard before, emerging physicians, nurses, therapies, all disciplines. It is more than just one person doing, giving the miracle drug or doing a thrombectomy, doing a, a clipping, a coiling, a hemicranies. Um, we need to have protocols that are evidence-based. There we go. So how do we get there? We have to solve our challenges. Everybody's challenges are unique. And I'm gonna show you a technique on how to truly get to where we need to get. We need to mitigate any issues and risks that we have. We have to do the research. We have to continuously learn. We have to educate what you learned. So for stroke programs, define your program, right? What services can you provide? And then do you know the manner at which you provide them? You identify challenges and solution to those challenges. Look beyond the now, have vision for the future, 
and use Teller Stroke Services to help others that are not as advanced as you guys. Give clear direction. If you know the fix, if you know the answer, if you know what needs to be done, please give direction to people within your team and, and to people who are not as fortunate as you are to have the experts that you guys have. So the first concept I'm gonna talk about is problem solving. And we across the country do not do this well, right? So we encourage the Einstein model. And, and what Einstein said is, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I would spend 55 minutes to truly think about what is the real problem? People don't do this well. Right. And if you spend 55 minutes to figure out what the real problem is, it should just take you about five minutes to come up with solutions. So spend more time in figuring out what's the root of the problem. A lot of folks love to get to that low hanging fruit and think I can just pull this fruit that's low hanging and I solve my issues. That's not the case. You need to put in the work. You need to dig into that ground and you need to find that root. If you find the root, you can solve it and keep it away. Low hanging fruit does not do it for you. Leaders, once you figure out what the problem is, once you know what the direction that you're trying to go, you have the solution, you need to give clear direction, right? It's very confusing when you do a procedure and the person at the end does not know what to do, right? And here's something that has been proven over and over and over again. If you take someone and blindfold them and you tell them in an open field to walk a straight line, what will happen without a doubt, eventually 100% of the time, this person will take off walking and eventually start walking in circles. They're walking in circles because they have no clear direction. They really don't understand that I am going the wrong way or which way I need to go to make it the right way. You could even take off the blindfold and put them in an environment where there's no clear direction, like in a, like in a, a winter storm. A and the reason people die in a winter storm when they're abandoned, because they're walking in circles. They're not going to where they need to go to. You can do that in the desert. That happened to me as a combat veteran. It happened to me in the desert. Where we were going around in circles, revisiting the same spot over and over again without our knowledge. So it can easily happen. Please give clear direction. Are you revisiting the same problems? Is your program looking at the same thing? Is your program like a whack-a-mole? You solve one thing and then you let go and then it comes back because you haven't really solved it. You've been going to that low hanging fruit, right? Are you revisiting the neural systems, the door to puncture, the door and door out times? These are things that we talk about all the time. And every time someone comes in to evaluate your program, we revisit the same exact things. Are you revisiting your same problems? If you are, dig down and get to that root. <clears throat> It's that route that will give you the solution. <laughs> so what am I saying is be the lighthouse, give true direction and prevent someone <clears throat> excuse me, from walking in circles in the dark, guide them. If you have the knowledge, you understand what needs to happen. Please tell them if you're a provider in this room and you expect something for your patient from the nurses who are right now, very young. A lot of seasoned nurses have left because of the pandemic. Are you truly giving them direction? You do this great life saving procedure. Are they delivering what you need for them to deliver? Educate them, be specific, be that lighthouse, be there for them so they can deliver for you and ultimately the patient. Anybody know who this guy is on your left? I'm the guy on the right, by the way. <clears throat> the guy on your left is a man called John Moon. 
John Moon is the very first EMT to intubate someone in the field. So pre-hospital intubate someone. He was trained by a gentleman, an anesthesiologist called Peter Saffer. Peter Saffer was the inventor of what we call today CPR, the ABCs of CPR. When Peter Saffer says, I'm gonna train someone who is not an anesthesiologist, who is not a doctor, who, who is not a CRNA, I'm gonna train him to intubate because we might need that uh, pre-hospital. They thought he was crazy. But the message from John Moon and Peter Saffer was if you educate someone, if you be that lighthouse, if you can tell them exactly what you want and give them clear direction, people will deliver for you. <clears throat> John Moon had one chance. When Peter Saffer trained him, he had one chance and he did it right the first time. If he would have missed the, the current treatment for EMTs would have not been there. It would have never happened, right? He stuck his neck out. He was confident that if I train and I give someone the competence and the confidence and I guide them, I be that lighthouse, we can deliver. Physicians, that's what we're asking from you. <clears throat> so we got to start out with EMS, right? They can do stuff for you. We need to involve them in what we do. And it can truly enhance, it can truly help us in hospitals lean forward, right? It can help us with early recognition and response. It can help us with pre-hospital assessments and triage for us, right? It'll help communicate and coordinate what we're trying to do as they arrive to the hospital, right? They can admit us their things that you need for the patient before they get here. They could transport to the appropriate facilities, not just a facility that can do the work, but they also understand what facilities can do the work right now, right? A lot of times they take a patient uh, to a hospital uh, because it's a stroke center. The next step for them is, is it the right stroke center right now? They can collect data for you quality improvement stuff. There, there's an EMS system in Florida right now that's collecting data for the stroke coordinator at a hospital. Every time <clears throat> someone calls EMS, they ask, why did you call? And the response that they give, they write it down, they collect that data. And if a patient arrives to the emergency room, walk in triage, they ask the same question. Why the different question, the opposite, why didn't you call? They're taking why didn't you call and why did you call? And, and they're collecting data and, and they're, they're really using that as their edu educational campaign for stroke patients or potential stroke patients. <laughs> and they can also provide community education with you and prevention. Public education is so important, right? You guys know this better than me. Right, it's the hypertension, the high cholesterol, the AFib. We talked about that today. It was a wonderful lecture, right? The smoking, the obesity, obesity, sleep apnea, drug and alcohol, the importance of calling in 911, time is brain. We need to stress that. I'm gonna talk to you about, as I travel across the country, I do see uh, community events by programs. And this is usually what I see. I see a poster that has stroke warning signs. Usually it has the BFAST signs, which is pretty appropriate, right? But what I don't see, and I'm starting to see now, is this one poster turning into a trifold poster. So this is what I want to suggest for you because sometimes people don't know the why. And if they know the why, they're more likely to do what you ask from them. So besides just telling them side one, be fast, this is what we have done in our state, is tell them reasons why. So I wanna read to you some of the reasons why we tell patients to dial 911. And it starts with the medical dispatcher. They will send the best team to you. We all know there's different levels of care in the field. We're gonna send the appropriate one to you. And number two is they're able to complete an assessment wherever, you're, wherever you are. 
Okay. They can begin uh, the treatment as well, right? They can also move you and transport you safely and efficiency. And what we teach is they can take you from the third floor to the ambulance. They can put you on a stretcher and wheel you to the ER. They can safely transport you in traffic because we have trained professionals to guide you through those red lights in traffic, right? The EMS clinicians will determine which hospital is best at that time. They know who's busy. They know who's not busy. They know who's capable of doing what needs to be done. And then lastly is the EMS clinicians will alert the emergency department in advance so that the team is ready for you. I can tell you these six reasons at community events get photographed more than anything else in the event. So I encourage you to take your one board and do the trifold. And then the third part is, so what happens if you do drive? Let them know the why, right? The care you need is delayed. You cannot speed or you may get pulled, pulled over, delaying the care you need. You cannot go through traffic lights. You may get stuck in traffic. And I can tell you that that's something you need to highlight here because it took me like 40 minutes to drive three miles. You will need to go to the emergency room registration and waiting room. And God forbid, it's very really busy. Your symptoms may get worse. You may cause an accident, causing more injury to yourself or others. Tell them the why and the hospitals that are telling potential patients or, pa or, or people in community events are really understanding the why and the EMS rates are, are skyrocketing up. It's really important. Another thing that uh, I, I wanna stress is this is something I came up with and I'll show you the effects of what this is. And, and this is something I call Stroke Fast Fridays. As a former ER director, um, I, I was like, how do we bring these people in? How do we truly get people to understand our message? So what Stroke Fast Fridays is, it, it provides stroke warning sign education to your community when they come to you. And this is what I mean. I directed everybody in my state, I directed everybody in my ER that every Friday, regardless of what someone, someone comes to your hospital with or for, to educate them and say, today is Stroke Fast Fridays. While you're waiting for lab results, while you're waiting for rad results, while you're hydrating someone, take 30 seconds of someone's time and say, I'm gonna teach you about stroke warning signs, regardless of what they're there for. That's your community. They came to you for a reason. Sometimes it's medical, sometimes it's injury, but you're teaching someone in your community that came to you on what to do, right? You can even have leaders as they're rounding on the floors upstairs, adopt Stroke Fast Fridays, right? Every patient that comes to a clinic, regardless of what that clinic is for, if you're all in, you teach stroke warning signs. This is your community. These are your people. This is the message that we wanna give and tell them the why as well. Here's an example of how many people you can reach. Just imagine a hospital that sees 70,000 patients per year. That's 10,000 patients or folks that you can teach. Usually they come with someone, so we'll multiply times two. That's 20,000 of your community members that came to you, so take that opportunity. Teach them to come to you. Because if they come to you, you can do what you do best, the gift of medicine. So how did I operationalize it? I want you to consider this. I made every nurse, every leader wear a badge buddy, and behind it, I had a QR code. And not only did I teach them stroke warning signs, or are they teaching stroke warning signs, I have them take out their phone, I have them scan the QR code, and now the message that I just gave them, they have on their phone permanently, forever, that they can refer back to it anytime. So my QR code that I created for my folks has been opened 24 million times. So 
That's a lot of folks. Some communities um, have reported my EMS rates are, grow up, are going up. My symptom onset to arrival uh, times are going down. So it's working. So Stroke Fast Fridays is beyond Stroke Awareness Month. I appreciate you guys having me here. I appreciate what you're doing to teach. Uh, and, and it's been a, a great curriculum so far. There's 18 million healthcare workers in the United States. We have a population of about 330 million. In 19 Stroke Fast Fridays, which is five months, if everybody's in, we can teach the population. This is how big it can get. I want to give you another concept that I have seen um, across the country. And when I came here several years ago, I said this, and I'm going to repeat this again. Providers, you guys are experts. You guys do very well. You guys are very busy. The, the, uh, the, the employment of advanced practice providers is so crucial. This is what I said before is that at this hospital, this is your secret sauce, right? This is where we rely on your advanced practice providers and the hospitals that do do that have better assessments and management. They have timely intervention. They help expedite care. They help with uh, education and counseling. They follow up with care and rehab. They're involved in quality improvement initiatives. Right, they're involved in community outreach and education. Advanced practice providers are a great support for your teams. Something else that's fairly new that we're seeing across the country, but it's having an enormous impact in the delivery of care it is someone that is called a family care specialist. And it's it's ironic, but everybody that that has this calls it the same thing. Right, and, and all it is is a person who their only job is to communicate with patients and families regarding all facets of care. It's usually in the ICU, but everything they talk about is in understandable terms. They talk about disease, they talk about process, they talk about treatments and expectations while in the ICU. It has one particular person who is assigned just to have a liaison between the patients and physicians, patients and nursing, physicians and physicians, and other disciplines like palliative care, hospice, life share, pastoral support. A significant change in the perception of care by having a family care specialist. They follow the guidelines of human dignity, they provide counseling and education, which family members just love. They're a member of the ethics committee. They facilitate and manage meetings to discuss goals and care and have those difficult end of life discussions with the physicians, with the nurses and with the family members in understandable terms. Something else that confuses your nurses, your staff. So physicians, this is where we need your help. And it's blood pressure management. And I tell you why, and I'm going to ask that you're the, the lighthouse, right? You give the clear direction because we all know that blood pressure management depends on various factors, including the type of stroke, the history, the current condition after the acute phase of stroke, long-term blood pressure management. We know, we, know, we know it's important. Controlling blood pressure is important, right? We need you to be the lighthouse for that nurse. And let me tell you why. Because nurses are confused. What should the blood pressure be before we give a thrombolytic? Do you guys know what it is? I'm sure you do. Do they know what it is, right? So what is it after we give a thrombolytic? What is it after we do that mechanical thrombectomy? What is it before we secure that aneurysm? What is it after we secure? When we diagnose a bleed, do we know where we're trying to be? What is permissive hypertension? How long do we let it go on for? Is it the same for TIAs as it is for CVAs? This is confusing. I am telling you, without a doubt, this is confusing to your nurses, unless you're the lighthouse. You're very, very clear. Now, how clear are we? This is where we have difficulty. I'm using the reference of 800 surveys across the country, right? This is how we communicate. 
The ED physician says, here's my order, here's my note. And hopefully the order to maintain the blood pressure at a certain range matches the note that they wrote. And then the admitting physician comes in and then the stroke neurologist comes in and then the neurosurgeon comes in and then the advanced practice provider comes in. This can be very confusing, confusing, especially when you're trying to adjust this blood pressure for the various reasons that you adjust a blood pressure for. Now, we write an order and we write a drug. We write a note, we, we, we write a medication. Sometimes these medications, and here's where it comes a little bit more confusing. The medications come from pharmacy, they're on a formulary, and they have a specific range for that drug. And we know that one drug can treat different phases of care, different types of stroke before and after treatment. So if your drug comes from the pharmacy on a formulary that has one specific goal and one specific parameter, we're going to get confused. It's also confusing because we give clinical practice guidelines, but we can adjust and we go beyond them. So be careful with this. Pretty important for the care of the patient that they're providing for you once you do that miracle intervention. Something else that's really important that we see across the country is a follow-up clinic. Clinic. We can't let these people go. We can't let these people go with the understanding of what's next, right? It, it, it's an essential thing that must occur. A lot of hospitals across, across the country don't have it. They write a discharge order, go find a neurologist in two to three weeks. How many neurologists do you know have openings in their clinic in two to three weeks, right? So have this clinic, uh, the clinic monitors recovery, it, it prevents reoccurrence, it, it adjusts their medications if they need to. It addresses their rehab needs, and they can detect other stuff that occurred once you discharge your patient. We always we always think about throughput. We're always concerned about length of stay. Sometimes they leave a little sooner. One, because they want to, or two, is because we have that pressure to release someone. But things can occur after you release. People can start getting depressed. Usually, it doesn't happen here in the hospital. There's cognitive impairment. There's swallowing difficulties. This is a good way to catch up uh, once a patient has left your facility. You have a heart attack. You have a cardiologist for the rest of your life. You have a stroke. The question is, do you have a stroke doctor for the rest of your life? You guys need to celebrate a job well done. For you leaders and providers, it means a lot from you to your healthcare team to congratulate them. We are so busy right now, we often forget this, but I can tell you it'll boost morale and motivation. You got to reinforce those positive behaviors and they'll come back over and over and over again. Don't get stuck in just your siloed expertise, procedure, or orders. These are human beings that work hard day in and day out for you and for the patient, right? Recognize them, get that team building, right? Positive reinforcement, they'll stay. If you treat them right, they'll stay. If you don't, someone else will, right? Have a culture that is positive and supportive and, and they'll deliver for you. I want to talk about the art of medicine. You guys talked about the science all day and did a phenomenal job. And you'll get back to that after this, this lecture here. But the art of medicine is just as important, right? It's the intuitive, empathetic, and compassionate aspects of healthcare that go beyond the scientific and technical aspects. There is an art to medicine. Don't lose that. It involves the humanistic elements of patient care. They're not just the guy in a room 12, right? It, it, it emphasizes the importance of human connection, empathy, and understanding in the practice of healthcare. It is essential for providing the holistic patient-centered care. Let me tell you something. We did a study 
a patient goes to the ER. We said, what do you expect? What do you want? What do you want from an ER? The first thing they write down is, I want to see the doctor. They want prompt attention. The second thing is they want compassionate and respectful care. The third thing is uh, clear communication and so on and so forth. Look, look at what the sixth thing is on this thing. Appropriate diagnosis and treatment. Now, is it off? Yes, right? That's what I want. I want you to treat me right, diagnose me right, so I can have a better outcome. But when you truly look at them, and we had a nice conversation uh, um, yesterday at dinner, we were talking about uh, a study uh, that, that asked people, would you wanna be disabled for the rest of your life or, or you want your life to end? And I'm paraphrasing. And most people that didn't have a stroke says, you know what, I don't wanna be disabled for the rest of my life. You know? But once they have a stroke, right they, they think differently save me right in the art of medicine we need to focus on what we need to do which is the sixth line appropriate diagnosis and treatment but we also need to give for patient family center care it is the things that they ask for as well so they ask for empathy compassion they ask for communication they ask for great judgment sensitivity uh, in the life care and, and palliative medicine. We all know what the golden rule is, right? You treat someone how you want to be treated. It's a, it's a journey into the way you think of, feel about, and speak to others. That's been replaced by the platinum rule, which is, it's really more of uh, how you know what the, how the people want to be treated, not how you want to be treated. Right? It's never about what you say. It's always about how so you make someone feel. So please remember that. There's this lady called Jean Watson, the theory of care. She created the theory of caring, right? And she shows that people want love, enjoy, need to be cared for. They, they want you to talk about not only the diagnosis and prognosis, they want you to understand or they need to understand that they're supported, that they're informed, that they're involved in their care, that the pain is addressed, sleeping patterns, bathing, and, and food. As a clinician, we truly believe that I'm going to provide you the best treatment. Let me tell you, these are other things that they ask for, right? So I, I, a quick story is my grandmother was in her deathbed. She's from California. I'm from Baltimore. I called the ICU nurse and I said, how's grandma doing? And what she told me was she's not doing well. She doesn't have that much time left. And then she told me, I combed your grandmother's hair today. And let me tell you, my grandmother for about 70 years, every Friday, she would go to the hair salon and sit there all day because her hair was her thing. She would sleep in a chair Friday night and Saturday night so she won't mess up her hair because Sunday morning at church, that was her thing. That was the platinum rule. They figured out what was important to her. They communicated that to me. And you know how good I felt? I asked the family care specialist, and I say, is grandma eating? And her response is like, your grandma hasn't eaten in 24 hours. My response to her was like, she's going to die. You're not feeding her, she's going to die. The family care specialist came back to me and says, Kenny, she's not dying because she's not eating. She's not eating because she's dying. Once I understood that, it made a lot of sense. I felt better. And she had 24 to 36 hours left. It meant so much for me, to me, that she understood the platinum rule and really explained to me what was happening when I was in a very emotional state. Another thing that we need to understand is the term competence versus confidence, right? They complement each other and are essential for what you guys do. 
it's often beneficial to do both of these. Right, because if you had competence, but you don't have competence to do what you're doing, then we have a problem. And vice versa, if you had a confidence, but don't have a confidence, then we're in trouble. Who has both? How can we be the lighthouse for the people that are providing care for your patients and give them the tools they need to be competent and confident in what you need them to do. It's really important. I want to talk to you about something that uh, is coined a stroke smart state. In, in a stroke smart state, there's only two in the country, and there's a bunch that are moving forward with this, right? In a stroke smart state is a public health initiative to reduce pre-hospital delays and increase timely stroke treatment through simple education and actions. And this Stroke Smart State Initiative, there's only two in the country right now, starts with a government proclamation at the, gov at the governor level. So let me show you what that means, right? What does a proclamation do? It shows government commitment. It shows community commitment. It shows health system partnership. It introduces you and your team and your healthcare system to other agencies that can support your initiative. So how do you get a proclamation? It starts with anyone from your organization, from any leader, and it goes up to the government. This is a proclamation that my state obtained. We're the second one in the country, and, and, and this allows us to do so much, and I'll explain. This is my governor saying, I am proud to call Maryland a stroke smart state. Uh, th these are uh, uh, public service announcements that we have. We have QR codes, we have magnets, we display everywhere in the state, right? When we have this proclamation, we can go into any sports arena. We can get on any jumbotron. We can go to any church, any barbershop, bowling alleys, shopping malls, beaches, library. We can go anywhere with this government proclamation because he has made it clear that we support being stroke smart. We go into police departments, pr public uh, transportation hubs. It doesn't matter. We have the right to go into these. So this is just one church that we went into. We gave magnets uh, of, of warning signs of stroke. We have created a proclamation toolkit. And here's my ask. Are we willing to move forward? This is an idea you don't have to commit right now, but I wrote your proclamation for you. I wrote the slides that that you would present to a leader in this organization. I wrote the slides for you to present to your local government. And within this proclamation, I included the hospital that would, has created the initiative. Yeah. So if you want to move forward with this, it's all written up for you guys. I'll be more than happy just to hand it over. So Belly, if you're interested, if you get it from the team, let's make uh, this hospital the sponsor of, of Stroke Smart New York. So what does Stroke Smart New York uh, can do for you? I can tell you in my state, we made it mandatory because the governor said to train the law enforcement, let me tell you why. So this is a video cam. This is a police officer that pulled over a, a drunk, quote unquote, drunk lady. This lady was at work. She started having a headache. She didn't feel good. She told her employer, I have to go home. As she's driving home, she's weaving. She crashed into a pole. She's climbing over grass. So this is the dash cam showing the police officer approaching the vehicle of this quote unquote drunk lady. This is him saying, you know what? You're drunk, you're arrested for a DUI. This is her getting slammed against his car, getting cuffed, ready to go to jail. This is the health screening tool that police officers use to do interviews when they think someone is drunk. The police officer says, didn't ask, 
no need to guaranteed she was drunk she was weaving all over the place she crashed she was placed in a cell for 24 hours she laid on the floor in the cell found in a puddle of urine she was taken to the hospital and diagnosed with a hemorrhagic stroke this is why we are training every single law enforcement in our state we are training them to take care of themselves we are training them to distinguish between someone who's drunk and someone who's possibly having a stroke this person is representing that young lady this is what she needs to this procedure she had to have because the officer assumed that she was drunk and threw her in jail. She had so much pressure in the, uh, pressure in the, in the brain. This is what they had to do to her. I know that stroke patients are hard work. I know we have to act quick. We have to act quick. I understand that they require a lot of patience. I know the treatment requires intentional skill of science, and now you know of art. If they live, they have a hard road to recovery. If they recover, they're never the same. You guys know this better than me, right? There's a 29% chance that patient that you're taking care of may not be alive in one year. And if they're greater than 65 years old, there's a higher chance that they will not be alive in one year. 31% need help taking care of themselves. A third of them develop depression. 20% 20 need, 20 need some assistance for walking. 16% will never get to go home again. Here's my message to you. Families pray for you to do your best. That's all I'm asking. Let's do your best. You don't have to be perfect to be awesome. You can strive for it. Do your best. Your talents are someone's gift. Each person is so real with true feelings and needs. Each person is loved so much by someone you will never, ever meet. This is the responsibility that you gave yourself joining the profession and joining the skill that you chose. These people are real. Create stroke thrivers, not just survivors. Right? I want you to make those last memories great ones. They deserve it. They want it. It's been my pleasure, my privilege, and my purpose to talk to you today. Thank you so much for what you do. Any questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Barajas, for that amazing talk. That's really touching a moment for us. Uh, really uh, summarize what uh, we're all here uh, for a purpose, to help the patient. That even though they may be strangers to us, we never met before, but they are loved ones for someone. And we're here for as a mission, as a team. And what you provided not only is a roadmap for us, from not only institution-wide, but also system-wide, from statewide, how to deliver care more efficiently, more effectively to our patients, but also putting onto a humanistic touch to this, the art of and the human aspect of patient care in stroke patients. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Kenny, thank you again. Galina, nurse practitioner in the stroke. Um, so Kenny, you told us great, inspiring things that we would, um, you know, uh, try to accomplish as well. And some of those we are truly doing. 
Um, but I wanted to ask you, since you traveled so, you know, throughout the country and you do see different stroke centers doing different things, maybe some of them that what we are not doing, um, but maybe you can share what I specifically want to ask you is about follow up the patients, follow up after the strokes. Those patients that we are like, when they see in the doctors, it's mostly a month or sometimes even a little bit later. But what we've encountered, the challenges are when we call those patients, especially post-TNK, uh, seven days, they're all so confused. They still don't know what medications to take. They have double medications at home, which they didn't stop taking. I wanted to know that if you saw any different strategies that we can maybe use for our stroke center to kind of improve that and to make it better and kind of for them not to be rehospitalized, perhaps. And yeah. thank you again for your great speech. Oh, no problem. Great question. So there, there is a, a uh, there's plenty of initiatives across the country. There's one hospital in Louisiana who, who have received grants and, and their grant is to employ nurse practitioners and PAs to follow up in a mobile unit with patients and get them the right medications, get them the right treatment, assess for new comorbidities, assess for new strategies to prevent them from having a new stroke. Uh, it is important to follow up with them. A and we've proven that the more you follow up with someone, the more guidance you give someone, the better the outcomes. Here in the hospital, we preach, educate, educate, educate. For God's sakes, they had a stroke. Right, the chances of them retaining everything we said is pretty minimal. So that reinforcement uh, is key. So strategies of making sure that everybody definitely makes it to a follow up appointment or, or two, consider writing a grant and saying if we can go to them and, and give them the direction that they need. No more questions. Thank you again, Kenny. Appreciate that.